Hello everyone, my name is Eric Nielsen. Uh, I'm your professor in sociology. There's another video in the modules to watch that kind of introduces you to the Canvas course, um, where to find Packback and so on and so forth. So this lecture is the first substantive one. We're jumping right into uh, chapter one and talking about you know what is social psychology in many ways it's the merger of sociology which looks at groups institutions organizations excuse me uh cultures and so on and then we've also got psychology uh, which is basically the study of human thoughts and, and feelings and things like that and social psychology is sort of the you know the merger as i said of these two where we start to try and figure out uh, how the si social situation influences our behavior okay so in this class you will be reading a couple of books uh, you've got the standard textbook here that's written by some of the top social psychologists uh, in the world you've also got we'll be reading a shorter book shorter as in i guess 400 pages, <laughs> um, called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. So that should be a very uh, relevant reading for, for these times that we're living in. So when we talk about the social situation and different cultures and uh, different types of thinking and so on and so forth, I think it's interesting to show the different the different uh, covers for The Righteous Mind. So here we've got the American version. I believe this is the one that you're getting. Um, and then here we've got the British version, which, uh, which is showing showing a uh, finger flipping you off. So I'm not quite sure why, why uh, they have those differences there. Okay, um, so social psychology is the as I said, it's uh, combines basically the insights of psychology with uh, the influence of sociology. Am I gonna spend a lot of time on this? But personality psychology spends personality psychologists study how a person's personality is developed, and you know this, their sense of self, um, and how you know all of these things affect who they are. Uh, cognitive psychology looks at a more kind of mechanical processes of our minds and how we uh, how we think and you know some of these things and then sociology is looking at groups organizations institutions um, and so on so I think the one thing that most cognitive and personality psychology uh, perspectives struggle with is sort of the historical moment um, so a lot of psychology has been, as we'll talk about, has been very Western and it's been made, all sorts of assumptions have been made that have been, you know, incorrect and so on and so forth. Um, so this is why we need to sort of rigorously test experiments uh, and, and things like this. So, um, as I was saying, when we look at the development of social psychology, it's a bit more recent. It's it's newer than uh, sociology or other forms of psychology, and a lot of social psychology, you know, grew quite a bit after the Second World War, um, and uh, as the Holocaust was happening, you you saw a huge number of intellectuals and uh, Jewish people and so on leaving uh, Nazi Germany and Nazi occupied territories. A lot of them came to the United States, and a lot of them were interested in what was going on in Germany. What what just happened? Um, Kurt Lewin is kind of, we think of him as one of the founders of modern social psychology. And so he was, you know, like a lot of people who are fleeing that time, he was wondering, okay, were all Nazis evil? And just, you know, even the civilian people, not the soldiers, were they just evil and cruel and so on? Or were they normal people who are following orders, who were, you know, kind of, you know, in sort of a you know mass delusion or something like this so the holocaust became not in the, not just the holocaust but the rise of fascism and soviet uh, communism and so on all of these things were you know gave uh gave a lot of impetus for for social psychologists uh, to to develop their theories 
One of Kurt Lewin's famous theories is this idea of force field analysis, that basically you've got your present state uh, or your desired state that you'd like to be in. You've got positive forces that are pushing you to, you know, get your homework done on time and so on and so forth. But you've got obstacles to change, such as, you know, technical difficulties uh, uh, with Zoom and whatever. So anyway, this was, you know, very, very, very basic social psych, um, but, you know, you have to start it somewhere. It wasn't only social psychologists who were looking at at um, at Nazi Germany and so on. It was also uh, just philosophers who had a huge impact on uh, psychology subsequently. So Hannah Arendt, a famous scholar in this area, says, in an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, think everything was possible and that nothing was true. Hmm, that sounds... Is this written in uh, 2005? It could be 2020, I mean. Jeez, okay. <laughs> so one of her, her most famous works is The Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, and she looks at specifically both the rise of Nazism in Germany and Soviet communism in Russia. And she, she also kind of explored this a bit further and wrote this famous book called Eichmann in Jerusalem. In this book, she was trying to understand, you know, how is it that people made these decisions? And Eichmann was a famous uh, Nazi who had helped develop and, you know, helped run the concentration uh, camp system. And, you know, they, he and others just said, well, we were following orders. And Hannah Arendt, you know, she kind of watched this going on, the trials and so on. And she said, you know, Maybe they're not just evil people, but they're banal. There's a sort of uh, banal evilness to them. What, what does banal mean? Uh, in her sense, she, to using it, she calls it this secondary stupidity. Um, but basically, where it becomes easier to just follow orders, and once you once you sort of get into that uh, process, it's hard to break away. Um, anyway, so it, her work is controversial, so it's not not everyone agrees, but that's uh, sort of you know, one way, one, one way of looking at it. Um, there are a number of great books that, that have come out kind of from the, the, the Soviet, the Nazi period and the Soviet period. Um, and a lot of these are memoirs or collections of journals and notes. I've been reading this for the last year and the last few months, especially just because I've been interested in, you know, why, you know, how they made those decisions, how people made it through, um, you know, when it seemed like all, you know, the world was ending, and so on and so forth. There were a group of scholars, primarily left-wing scholars, who in the early 1930s were had this institute, this Institute of Social Science Research, and they were looking at a number of things. They turned into what's called the Frankfurt School. Um, they were trying to basically apply it, the the philosophies of Karl Marx to what was going on at the time. And we saw the Great Depression, basically, that had just happened, or was going, that was happening, I should say. And so basically the Frankfurt School thought that, you know, the workers, working class would all join socialism and you'd see this uh, communist revolution and so on and so forth. And that's not what happened. Uh, you know, people went to the Nazi party and, and other parties and so on and so forth. And so it was this big, you know, this big sort of realization that, the, you know, this uh, philosophy, the Marxist philosophy of uh, revolutionary change just didn't seem to work. One of the famous people that comes out of the Frankfurt School that's relevant for us in social psych is Theodore Adorno. And uh, whether you like him or not, he played a had a big influence on social science uh, in the study of fascism and so on and so forth. Um, he has a number of sayings. So he was one of the authors of this, this book called The Authoritarian Personality. And so The Authoritarian Personality is one of the first, actually the first attempt to try and see if there was a personality type that aligned with fascism. If you could, if you could sort of identify fascists before they, you know, before they took over, uh, basically. And that was the thinking. And so Adorno and a number of other people 
worked on this. Now it should be pointed out that actually Adorno did not write very much of this. They just his name is starts with A. Uh, you usually in um, scientific work, if you're the main author, you know your name comes first. But that's not how they did this. So I think uh, it's actually Levinson or Sanford who have the most uh, chapters in this. Anyway. Okay, so what they do in this is they develop something called the F scale, which is basically the fascism scale, because uh, they want to see if they can measure it. They came up with a survey that's been just demolished in the years since then for having all sorts of inaccuracies uh, and so on and so forth. Um, they also interviewed in a number of people uh, who had scored a different, had different scores on uh, the F scale and, and sort of develop this this idea of the authoritarian personality. As I said, it's been widely criticized. It it's kind of builds on Freudian psychology, which, you know, is, you know, psychology has sort of moved on from that. Um, but so there's not necessarily a lot that will help us, you know, understand the current political movement from the authoritarian personality uh, per se. But if you are sort of, you know, interested in studying this authoritarian personality, you know, really in depth, this is probably, uh, you know, a good place to start, the place to start. Now we know that, you know, one of the things that you know, has a big impact on social psychology that probably doesn't get as much uh, mention is inequality and how inequalities can affect affect how people think um, and how where people are in a social structure, whether they're elites or workers or serfs, slaves, uh, and so on and so forth. Basically, you see that throughout history, the elites have, you know, justified their systems because, you know, the rabble are, you know, just a bunch of simple-minded children or something like this, so a very condescending view of, of uh, different people in, in, in the social structure. So this is something, again, that we really, there's the socio sociological perspective coming in, something we need to uh, think about in, in great detail. Okay. Some of you may be familiar with this, um, the famous Stanley Milgram experiment. I'll post a few uh, videos in the modules that will, do, that will do a good job of covering this. But basically, he was interested in studying obedience. And so they set up this experiment where they had this, it was this, uh, it was set up as this study of memory and study of learning and so on. And there were participants who were there and they were supposed to read a list of words uh, to the to the other person. And if the other person, you know, didn't repeat them correctly, then they would be shocked. So I'll just say that subject number one is the real subject. There's, that's who they're actually studying. Um, but they're telling subject number one that there's, they're doing this memory, memory study. But, and they bring them into this, this other room and there's supposedly uh, the other uh, participant, what we call a confederate, meaning that they're part of the experiment, but pretending that they're another subject. Um, and so he's in there and he's got a bunch of electrodes that are, you know, attached to him. And so the actual subject goes back in another room um, and starts reading this list of words and asking the, the person, the confederate, to read, uh, read them back. Kind of the key thing here is that for each wrong answer, the shock level goes up a bit, it goes up another like 15 points or something like this, or 100 points or whatever. Um, and so they're supposed to, for each time they get it wrong, supposed to administer a greater shock, meaning that, you know, it's going to be more, uh, more painful over time. And they're trying to figure out how far uh, these individuals will shock, go in shocking another person just because someone uh, in authority is telling them to do that. And what you saw is that people were pretty, you know, people tend to go pretty far. So there you see the, you know, the, act the actual subject is sitting in front of this, you know, what is called box full of box of voltages. <laughs> um, okay. And basically administering, you know, an, uh, another shock for each level that they get wrong, thinking that they are electrocuting this person. In reality, this person is not getting any shocks. Uh, they're just pretending and they're pretending to yell. Uh, they actually have a recording that they play. So it's, you know, the same for everybody. And they're basically, the person is saying, ouch, every time he's getting shocked, he's like, get me out of here. I didn't, you know, I didn't sign up for for all this, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the actual subject looks over at the experimenter in the white lab coat and the 
experiment or such. No, you must complete the experiment. And, uh, you know, what's kind of kind of crazy is 62, 63% uh, of participants completed the experiment um, or willing to keep on shocking another person just because they were being told to by, you know, a guy in a lab coat, uh, a guy uh, in authority. And the Milgram experiment, you know, then they, they, they do a whole bunch of other things. I'll post the video, um, you know, where they go outside of the campus, go to New Jersey, do it there. They have um, they have different ones where people are in the same room uh, as the person who are supposedly pretending or supposedly getting shocked, but pretending to. Um, they have ones where, you know, it's all done by phone. You know, and they, what they find is that basically as people are taken further away from, you know, immediate contact, uh, it's much easier to administer these shocks. When they're told to by a uh, experimenter in, in person, it's much easier to. When the other person, though, is in front of them and, you know, acting like they're getting shocked, you know, that's harder for people to 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 manage. Really, you know, influential study kind of, you know, you can't do studies like this because uh, it's actually kind of unethical to be, f you know, kind of fooling people that dramatically in the sense that they might uh, think that they're hurting somebody. Milgram, he says the disappearance of a sense of responsibility is the most far reaching consequence of submission to authority. So I'm just following orders, you know, that kind of goes, goes, you know, fits in here. Um, you know, he, at the end of the doc documentary, has this very sobering line about, you know, if, you know, a guy in a white lab coat can make people do this, you know, you know, electrocute a middle-aged man, um, then imagine what our government, governments can do with all of their resources. So really kind of a sobering, sobering uh, set of sobering final statement uh, of that documentary. Okay, again, sociology, you start to see how these things come together. The other thing that we'll be discussing is our biological makeup. Now, um, we won't be discussing it, you know, a whole lot. Um, <clears throat> We'll focus more on social situations and so on, but you know the intersection between biology and society is uh, increasingly very fascinating, and the science is growing and growing. Um, and I think it's, and I, I you know it's 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 made this class more exciting. I think. Oops. Okay, so that other slide will show up in a different lecture. Okay, so this one is kind of key for understanding how we are going to look at nature and nurture. Nature is the social environment, the culture uh, that we grow up in, and so on. Nurture is our genes, our, uh, you know, neurobiology, uh, and things like that, you know, things we're essentially born with. So a famous social uh, psychologist, Gordon Alport, said that, you know, individuals have dispositions. It's their kind of main personality traits or something like this, or sometimes we call them temperaments. Um, you know, melancholy, you know, uh, sanguine, you know, happy, joyful, angry, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, predispositions, um, <clears throat> this is biological, that some of our uh, our thought processes, some of the way our brains are structured and so on, um, make us uniquely predisposed to act one way or another. And we'll talk about this interesting intersection uh, in great detail throughout this class. Um, I do want to just kind of, you know, look at, you know, this kind of, I, I believe this does a good job of showing uh, the role of biology. So you see here, this is um, a relationship to person with schizophrenia and a risk of d developing schizophrenia themselves. 48% of identical twins. So that's pretty amazing. Significantly higher than for any other uh, group. Frater uh, fraternal twins, it's 17%. Um, just children, 13%. So really kind of interesting. But you, just, you know, identical twins, uh, you know, we can learn a lot from the study of identical twins. One of the key concepts in social psychology is the fundamental attribution error. And one of my goals in this class is that you will never make this error again, or you know, at least not make it as much. So the fundamental error, fundamental attribution error, is this failure to recognize the social situation and to recognize that our dispositions might be sort of uh, caused by by the social situation that we're in. 
So say you are going into a coffee shop or <laughs> going through a drive through I guess, um, and getting some coffee. And the, the barista seems angry, so he's kind of cold and so on, not really, uh, you know, not very smiley, anything. Well, this person is uh, not a very good person. They're just angry and whatever. Maybe, you know, they have had someone who became very ill a few days ago and, you know, they're just, their minds elsewhere, they're struggling and so on and so forth. So this is a, a very easy <laughs> error to make. And, you know, I make it uh, myself uh, quite often, but the goal is that we won't make it as often as we, as we do. Another key term here is what we call channel factors. <clears throat> channel factors, these are the, those, the sort of things that sort of influence us one way or another. These uh, situational circumstances, basically, that are extremely important that we don't really even, wouldn't even think of. Um, and this, we see this a lot in what's called behavioral economics, um, which we'll talk about more later in this class. So a, a good example of uh, the chan of channel factors. And this would be good for uh, maybe thinking about vaccines and so on too. <clears throat> so there's this famous study done uh, back in the 1960s at Yale. And what they did was they were trying to see um, if they could get students to go and get a tetanus shot. And so what they did, they had two groups. You had one uh, group that was shown pictures of people with lockjaw and they're told about uh, the dangers of tetanus and so on. And, you know, they... And, and, and so on. This is the, that's the first group. They get all this information and they say, yes, they fill out a form. Yes, they'll get a tetanus shot. And only about 3% of them actually went in and got that tetanus shot. So the other group, though, um, they have another group of students where they uh, do the same thing. They show them pictures and so on. But then they also add a map and they show the map of campus and they circle uh, the where the health facility is. And um, and then they act very condescending to the student, acting kind of like as if they don't know their way around, you know, tell them where to go on the map and just kind of treating them like the, like their children. And, you know, these are college students, so, you know, they, they don't like to think, be condescended to like that and so on. So they're like, yeah, yeah I'm going to go do this. Um, so what they found is that those who received the map and the condescension, uh, they 20%, 28% of them went and got the tetanus shot. So that's a big difference. That's a really significant difference. And it's really was only caused by the map and the, the condescension. And you see, you know, a huge, huge increase in terms of people getting vaccinated uh, for, or getting the, the tetanus, yes, the tetanus vaccine, vaccination. Um, as I said, you know, we might need to think about this uh, for, our, for some vaccines in the coming years. One of the other channel factors, so you see these, you, you probably haven't seen these, uh, but when you get a sort of full-time job, career, whatever, you might see something about the retirement plan. If you do not wish to take part in the retirement plan that's funded in the company, um, please indicate that by checking in the box below. And then you've got this other one, seems very similar. If you wish to take part in the retirement plan uh, funded in part by the company, please you know, check the box below. So if you do not wish, or if you do wish. So what companies do now is they usually automa automatically enroll you, and then you have to sort of unenroll yourself uh, because basically they found that lot people weren't checking the box. Uh, so they weren't putting money away for uh, retirement savings and so on. Um, I see that newspapers are doing this too with uh, subscriptions, you know, online subscriptions and stuff, where they will sort of, you know, get a subscription, but it will be up to you to cancel it. Otherwise, it will automatically renew. Um, so they'll, you know, so you will be like me and you'll be like, oh, I should cancel my subscription to The Economist, but then I got to go in there and talk to people and, you know, do all that. So I'll just, you know, keep that in my subscription and so on. And, you know, already they've gotten me. <laughs> so anyway, that's what social psychology does. The other, another key term up there with uh, the fundamental attribution error is the role of construals. So construal, this is basically 
it's kind of like the fundamental attribution error. I mean, the attribution error can be a type of construal error. I mean, yeah. So the construal is basically how we how we interpret things. Um, and you know, when we get it wrong, if we say that it's caused by someone's disposition, uh, then that's the fundamental fundamental attribution error. Um, if we just sort of not don't understand what's going on, then we're misconstruing uh, the social st situation. <clears throat> Okay, so I think before I jump into uh, this any any more, I'm going to play a couple of videos looking at conformity. Um, and it's pretty fascinating when when you see people do this. Maybe some of you have seen this in a site class or or just online or whatever. Um, so uh, these are just kind of <clears throat> some short videos. I'll play both of them. I'll kind of uh, we'll end shortly after that. Play it after this ad. Okay. Should come soon. To answer that question, we set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this. Or would you? After just three beats, and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the groove. But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Okay, now she's alone, the crowd is gone, and nobody is watching her, except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? She's now conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. Now, watch what happens when we introduce another outsider who doesn't know the rules. Have a seat and they'll be out in just a couple minutes. Thanks so much. Think she'll teach the new guy what to do? We kept the cameras rolling as more unsuspecting patients arrived. And slowly but surely, what began as a random rule for this woman has now become the social norm for everyone in this waiting room. Here to explain what's going on in their brains is Jonah Berger of the University of Pennsylvania. This sort of internalized form of herd behavior is part of what we call social learning. Starting at a very early age, when we see members of our group perform a task, our brains literally reward us for following in their footsteps. When I saw everybody stand up, I felt like I needed to join them. Otherwise, I'm like excluded. Once I decided to go with it, then I felt much more comfortable. Conformity is how we become socialized, but it can also cause us to develop bad habits or repeat past wrongs. And it's why even this rebel who wasn't standing for any of this nonsense, eventually joined the ranks. 
And the only thing more shocking than seeing how easily conformity affects the way you act is that similar forces are subconsciously shaping the way you think. Okay, let's see. Now the next, next video. Maybe some of you have seen something like this. Naturally, you turn and face the door, right? It's just what we do without even thinking. Here on Would You Fall For That, we decided we had to pay homage to Candid Camera. How this man tries to maintain his individuality. So right now we are reenacting their famous test of conformity. The elevator experiment. So we found a nice elevator at the Juilliard School and gathered our Would You Fall For That stuff. If we turn to face the back of the elevator, would others follow? All right, in the blue t-shirt, that is Nadia. She is an innocent passerby. Has nothing to do with this. Everybody else in that elevator, they all work for Wait. Would You Fall For That. They are all in on the experiment. They are all purposefully facing the wrong way. Nadia is facing the front. You can just see the back of her head wearing the blue t-shirt. That's Nadia. She is facing the front of the elevator like a normal human being. Everybody else is facing the back. We're playing this to you in real time, no editing, as it actually happened. Okay, floor two. Rebecca gets off. Emily gets on. She also works for us. We're swapping people in and out to reinforce the behavior. Emily's acting like it's the most normal. Oh! Nadia's turned. Nadia, it, okay, her bag is slipping off her shoulder. She's nervously playing with it. Yeah. Nadia's now halfway round. Will she go any further? Emily gets off. Mike gets on. Again, Mike works for the show. Presses his button, faces the back like it's the most normal thing in the world, like he does it every day. Nadia is really feeling the pressure right now. I'm not going to see anyone else. Isn't he on Scott's making some small talk. He was on Celebrity Rehab, I think. Oh. Yeah. She's looking towards the back of the elevator because everybody else is. Floor four. Fourth floor, Mike gets off. Lauren gets on. Lauren also works for us. She's in. Oh, and Nadia, Nadia. Nadia has gone. The fourth floor, Nadia has turned all the way around. She's looking at the back of the elevator. That is not normal human behavior. Nadia is looking at the back of the elevator purely because everybody else is. Okay, you've seen it in real time. Let's play that for you again in Fast Forward. Nadia, turning, 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 turn. Did you notice anything while we were standing in the elevator? We were all facing one way, and we wanted to see if one oh, person would do it. And you, you did it, yeah. So you were wondering why. Yeah. But you just went along with it without even questioning. Yeah. Social scientists refer to this as the ash paradigm, when a person's own opinions and actions are influenced by the majority of the group. The lady with the gray coat, she is a civilian. Everybody else in the elevator is on our team. That is Elizabeth. She's facing the front as she should, but she's looking around. She's noticed that everybody else is facing the back. She's looking around what's going on this is a bit odd everybody else is acting like nothing strange is happening elizabeth is looking around like something very strange is happening We're on the second floor she's slightly turned she's turned look at her shoulders she's not facing the front anymore she's moved emily gets on again she's with us presses her button elizabeth looks at her emily faces the back elizabeth is turning elizabeth is turning She's pretending she's just looking around, but that's a cover. She's actually turning as well. All right. I think you get the idea. Pretty fascinating. Uh, you know, classic, classic experiments in, in social psych. Um, so let's go back here. Um, and you can see how we can misconstrue things and, you know, uh, not realize that you're being part of a big experiment like we are in with uh, COVID and so on and etc. 
Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop today. Um, obviously, we'll uh, have more time in the future, um, but I, given everything that's going on and the chaos and so on, uh, I just think, you know, take at least this for first week a little bit slower. So again, for pack back, you won't need that uh, until next, next Tuesday. Um, I'll be in touch, and I hope you have a good day.